Well, hello everyone and welcome to my library. If you're new here, hello, my name is Chinsia. And if you're not new here, you're one of the lovely regulars. Hi, how are you? I hope you're doing splendidly. So before we get into today's video all about Atlantis, which is multi-part because it's going to be extensive and, you know, there'll be many, many parts to it. I just want to say a huge thank you for everyone who made this possible. After over 11 years of being on this darn platform, I have finally got the plank. I've had this channel for 11 years. I had another channel many years before that, but for only just a year, I would say. So around 12 years online, I finally got this. Thank you so much for everyone who is subscribed and made this possible. It is the only award I will ever get from YouTube. And it's the only thing I have that's tangible to say, yes, you persevered for 12 years of your life and it, it paid off. So if you are an American watching this video, there is a three out of five chance that you believe in Atlantis. You see, a survey conducted by the Chapman University in October 2014 found that at the time, roughly 63% of people in, in the United States agreed or strongly agreed with the statement, ancient advanced civilizations such as Atlantis once existed. And these numbers uh, do not seem to be rapidly falling away either. When Chapman University conducted the same survey again in October of 2018, they found that at this time around 57% of people in the United States agreed or strongly agreed with the exact same statement. So if you're on the internet, you know that thousands of people out there are convinced that Atlantis is a historical place. This wonderful advanced city that sunk below the, the realms of the ocean. And many people are so dedicated to proving that it is more than a myth that they have dedicated websites and YouTube channels to proving its existence. But you'll be forgiven in believing that the theory of Atlantis's existence uh, is a modern concept. It's been around for a wee while. So over this series, I'm going to be looking at the different kind of, you know, statements, theories that are out there about Atlantis, debunking them one at a time. But I thought for today's video, I will look at one conspiracy theory, i.e. the origin of the contemporary conspiracy theory, and actually explain what Atlantis is, as far as we know it. So let's look at Atlantis from its earliest records and work our way through the theories that have existed ever since. So the original story of the lost island of Atlantis comes from two Socratic dialogues called Timaeus and Critias. Both were written around 360 BCE by the Greek philosopher Plato. Yes, I will mispronounce many of these names. I have tried my best. Do not trust my judgment. When it comes to pronunciation, I am heavily dyslexic. So let's get into these dialogues. You see, together, the dialogues are actually a festival speech prepared by Plato to be told on the day of the Panathenaea in honour of the goddess Athea. The dialogues describe a meeting of men who had met the previous day to hear Socrates describe the ideal state. According to the dialogue, Socrates asked three men to meet him and tell him stories about how ancient Athens interacted with other states. The Critias goes first with telling them a story about how his grandfather met an Athenian poet and lawgiver called Solon, one of the seven sages. Solon had been to Egypt and heard all about how the priests discussed legends and gods, and they also compared Egypt to Athens. It was here that Solon heard about the Egyptian story of Atlantis. According to the Egyptian story, as told by Solon to Critias' grandfather, who told Critias, who told Socrates, there was, once upon a time, a mighty power in the Atlantic Ocean, an empire named Atlantis, that ruled over several islands and parts of Africa and Europe. Atlantis was arranged in concentric rings of alternating water and land. The soil was rich and fertile, and its architecture magnificent. The military was outstanding, and the entire civilization was ruled by kings and a civil administration. The Atlanteans were lovers of the Athenians, and there were rumours that they were actually related as well. But one day, Atlantis decided to attack Asia and Europe, completely unprovoked. Though a much smaller state, Athens triumphed over the invading Atlanteans and freed all those that the Atlanteans had enslaved. After the battle, Critias explains, there, quote, occurred violent earthquakes and floods, and in a single day and night of rain, all your warlike men in a body sunk into the earth, and the island of Atlantis in like a manner disappeared and was sunk beneath the sea. And that is the reason why the sea in those parts is impassable and impenetrable, because there is such a quantity of shallow mud in the way, and this was caused by the subsidence of the island. Okay, so 
We know the basic story of Atlantis. What's the history behind the story? Are they characters telling a parable or individuals reciting historical events? Well, let's start off with the easy part first. The story itself is about a conflict between the ancient Atlanteans and Athenians 9,000 years before Plato's time. But let's point out the obvious, Athens didn't exist 9,000 years before Plato. And Plato, in fact, everyone present would have known that. Plato lived between circa 428 to 347 BCE, and Athens had only, I say only, had been inhabited since the Neolithic period, circa 3000 BCE. So there couldn't have been an ancient battle between Athens and Atlantis. Athens didn't exist then. Now let's look at the storyteller, Critias. There are two possible real-life Critias's whom this character could be. The first is Critias, the great-uncle of Plato, and like Plato, was also a student of Socrates. Born to, I'm going to guess, Calescorus, circa 460 BCE, Critias was an Athenian philosopher, rhetorician, poet, historian, and political leader, best known for his violent leading role in the pro-Spartan government of the Thirty, which took place between 404 to 403 BCE. Critias appears as a character in several of Plato's dialogues, including Charmonides and Protagoras, but he was actually long dead by the time of the Atlantis story was written by Plato. That is, of course, if the Critias in the dialogues is the Critias from the Thirty, as some scholars have argued that this Critias is actually a different one. In fact, they believe this Critias is the grandfather of the oligarch. Those who believe that he is the grandfather note the anachronism between Critias of the Thirty, who lived between 460 and 403 BCE, and the famous lawmaker Solon, who told him the story of Atlantis, because Solon lived between 638 to 558 BCE. So clearly, their lives did not interconnect. So, if the Critias of the dialogue was a real person, then why wouldn't the story of Atlantis be real? Well, first, even if Critias was a real person, to take this story as factual, we have to assume that the conversation between Socrates and Critias took place at all, with Plato present. This assumption reduces Plato to a reporter role, but Plato wasn't some kind of reporter, he was a philosopher in his own right, who was acknowledged as an original thinker by others in his time. Plato's dialogues are a distinctive feature of his writing that separates him from other philosophers of his time. Plato's fictional dialogues are not used to tell stories, but to capture philosophical discussions taking place between a small number of historical interlocutors. But his dialogues don't present the nature of their character or reflection of their realism. Rather, his interlocutors help draw his readers into the discussion, whilst also presenting the opportunity for Plato to subtly comment on or criticise the social milieu and ways of life of his speakers. For example, Socrates is a real historical figure that features heavily throughout Plato's dialogues, but featuring Socrates as a figure in one's work was a literary technique of the time, as demonstrated by Socrates' presence in Aristophanes' comedy, Clowns, and also in Xenophon's Apology. It was a literary technique for people to include people they knew within their fictionalised worlds. Now, let's talk about Atlantis itself. The first and only known record that we have of any mention of Atlantis is from this dialogue by Plato. Any other references to the sunken city came afterwards, and all of them are clearly based on Plato's story. This means either one of three things. One, that the story of Atlantis existed for 9,000 years entirely in oral tradition, spread word of mouth from person to person accurately for 9,000 years until Plato was the first person to document its existence. Two, that all documentation or reference to Atlantis before Plato's documentation of it that existed across multiple civilizations, because Atlantis was influential and well-renowned apparently, all of those references were conveniently destroyed and lost across the world. Or, option number three, Plato made it up as an allegory to warn Athenians about the hubris of nations, drawing influence from various events from his own lifetime and recent history. Remember, Atlantis isn't to be admired, although people have now made it to be the admired state, the utopia as it were, Thomas More. It was not the ideal state according to Plato's story. 
Atlantis is only relevant in the story because it is demonstrative of a mighty, highly sophisticated non-Greek empire that Athens overcame, thus demonstrating their superiority. So the academic consensus regarding Atlantis is that the myth is a parable for two cities fighting a cultural and political war, with the small city defeating the mighty empiric aggressor. To most, the tale mirrors the political realities of Greece's conflicts with civilizations such as Persia or Carthage. In the early 5th century, the Achaemenid Persian Empire was a mighty, highly sophisticated, non-Greek empire, just like Atlantis is described as being. In 480 BCE, the Achaemenid Shah, i.e. the King of Kings, Xerxes I, led a massive army to Greece, seeking to conquer it, but the Persian forces were repulsed by a coalition of Greek city-states, of which Athens was arguably the most prominent. Athens then liberated the Greek city-states of Asia Minor from Achaemenid rule, and in 478 BCE, the Greeks established a Delian League alliance between city-states, which was dedicated to preventing another Persian invasion. The axiomatic belief at the time of Plato was that the, the defeat of the Achaemenid Empire was the result of its own hubris, as exemplified by the play The Persians by Athenian tragedian Aeschylus. Why is Athenian tragedian really hard to say? So, Plato's Atlantis story is merely an ancient retelling of the Greco-Persian conflict taking place 9,000 years earlier, in the same way religious texts reverberate these stories in a way to make them parables for learning. Additionally, according to classical scholar Rodney Castleton, the lengthy governmental and political structure of Atlantis resembles that of the Greek city-state of Syracuse in Sicily, which Plato is known to have visited. But you see, Plato didn't have a great time in Syracuse. According to Diogenes Laertius, it was there that Plato was sold into slavery by the tyrant Dion, and he was only liberated thanks to the philosopher Anacharis who bought him. Like everything we read in ancient history, this story may not be true. However, it's interesting how Atlantis mirrors the government of a malevolent aggressor with whom Plato himself is rumoured to have had a personal issue with. Well, Persia didn't sink Chinsia, I hear you say. So what's with the whole disappearing island? Well, the island's disappearance may be a reference to the Minoan volcanic eruption which devastated the Aegean island of Thera, also now known as Santorini. So around 3,500 years ago, around 1,500 BCE, the island's volcano erupted. At first, there was an earthquake, or potentially several, which partially destroyed the settlements, of which there is archaeological and volcanic evidence for, and then everything was blanketed with metres of volcanic ash. Much like the eruption in Pompeii, a good thing to come out of the latter catastrophe was that the ash preserved the settlement, crockery, furniture and frescoes. Then a pyroclastic flow followed the ash, causing a large tsunami, traces of which were found 200 to 300 metres above sea level. But, I hear you say, could a tsunami of the Aegean wipe out the Minoan civilization and bury it? Well, okay, so this isn't my area of expertise, let's just put it out there, but I've done my best to try and find out information to explain this topic. Forgive me for any mistakes that I make. Though, so what I can understand, in 2008, tsunami expert Costas Sinalakis, Sinalakis, my apologies, and the archeologist Alexander Sandy McGillivray claimed that the Minoan tsunami was similar to that which struck Sri Lanka in 2004, but, we should look at the fact that the coastlines of Sri Lanka and Crete are very different. Sri Lanka's coastlines are replete with large, very low elevation floodplains that are highly susceptible to tsunami damage, whereas Crete's coastlines are mountainous. So whilst the vulnerable northern coastal areas of Crete would have been inundated and completely destroyed, the tsunami wouldn't have affected anything higher up, such as Norsos, which is over five kilometers inland with an elevation of 90 meters. It was unlikely that a tsunami would have wiped out the entirety of Crete, like you can imagine in Atlantis, this whole island sinking. However, the more realistic cause of the decline of the Minoans is the damage that was caused to the coastal communities by the Thera explosion. You see, just a few years afterwards, the Minoan culture went into decline and was supplanted within a few generations by the Mycenaean culture from the Greek mainland. 
Obviously, we don't have access to the past. We can't estimate the cost to infrastructure and the loss of expert artisans that the volcanic eruption and the following tsunami caused to Crete. But we can guess that the damage done to the smaller islands around them, which would have been the Minoan trading partners, would have been drastic, as these smaller islands would have lacked the resources and manpower to rebuild themselves after the effects of the volcanic eruption. As such, the Minoans would have been double hit economically. Not only are they damaged financially, but they've lost their trading partners. Agriculturalists have also proven that earthquakes can not only impact water sources to the locals, but can render agricultural land useless by inundating it with salt water. And such changes to groundwater can devastate a region's economy and lead to famine. Thus, the lack of the Minoan agricultural surpluses, combined with higher shipping costs and new difficulty in acquiring critical resources, likely compromised the entire Minoan economy and thus its civilization. So if the entirety of the Minoan civilization wasn't wiped out by a massive tsunami, where did Plato get the idea of an island sinking? Well, okay, islands don't sink, they're not floating. However, sea levels rise. So I'm not saying that Plato would have been able to see sea levels rising over his period. However, we normally see the engulfing of small islands or landmass taking place over hundreds of thousands of years. However, it is possible that local stories of flooded neighbourhoods inspired Plato's experiment, as the ancient world was pretty damn familiar with earthquakes and floods, and various floods feature throughout Greek mythology, most notably the deluge of Deucalion, the son of Prometheus, who angered Zeus so much that Zeus flooded the greater parts of Greece, a myth very likely inspired by the Epic of Gilgamesh, which then went on to inspire other stories of great floods throughout religious texts. But Atlantis has another connection with the Minoan civilization, which I hinted at in my Minotaur video. You see, yes, this is where the Minotaur comes in. As I've already discussed at great length in my Minotaur video, the Minoan civilization, named after the myth of King Minos, the man who ruled with the Minotaur in his labyrinth, was the place that was affected by the eruption of Thera, which is why many people believe that Atlantis is the Minoan civilization, Crete, etc. To add credence to the idea that the Minoans are actually what the Atlanteans were based on, the Minoans had a relationship with Egypt, much like Plato's story says, as the last Egyptian relics found in Crete, according to Flinders Petrie, date back to the year around 1200 BCE, thus seeming to coincide with the downfall of the Minoan civilization. When it comes to the Minotaur and the defeat of the Minotaur, well, we have to look at its symbolism once again and compare it to the Atlantean symbolism. You see, the defeat of the Minoan Minotaur by the Athenian hero Theseus became a symbol of Athens' defeat of the Persian navy at Salamis. This means that if we look at Atlantis and the Minotaur here, that the Minoan civilization was used more than once as a symbol and metaphorical image for Athenian glory and Athenians' victories over the Persians. So let's break it down more geographically speaking. So if we look at Atlantis's surroundings, according to Plato, he said, from this island, you could easily pass to other islands and from them to the entire continent, which surrounds the interior sea. What there is on this side of the strait of which we are speaking resembles a vast gateway and the land which surrounds it is a real continent. In other words, there were other islands near Atlantis, and these were in an interior sea near to a continent, geographical data that applies perfectly to Crete in the Aegean Sea. We also know from Plato that Atlantis was a kingdom of some influence and power. Its kings, quote, had under their domain the entire island, as well as several other islands and some parts of the continent. Besides on hither side of the strait, they were still regaining over Libya as far as Egypt and over Europe as far as the Tyrrhenian. So it's potential, but these statements may apply to the Minoan Crete. You see, Crete may have easily ruled over many islands of the Aegean, as well as the Peloponnesus at the time of the Mycenae and the Tyrants, and over the North African coast of Serenica. The Minoans weren't a small force in ancient history. DNA evidence that came out in 2013 suggests that they were the first major European civilization. So let's go back to Arthur Evans, the archaeologist who discovered the Minoan civilization. He at the time suggested that the founders of the Minoan civilization were refugees from the Delta region of Egypt, when North Egypt was conquered by the southern king Nama at about 5,000 years ago. 
His evidence for this suggestion were the similarities between Minoan and Egyptian art, and elements that he was considering Libyan in origin, such as the codpiece worn by Bronze Age Cretans, and the circular tombs of the early inhabitants of southern Crete that were similar to tombs built by the Libyans. Based on a variety of archaeological finds, other archaeologists have argued for Cycladic, Anatolian, Syrian and Palestinian migration, or for an autochthonous development of the Minoan civilization from the initial inhabitants of Greece. In this study, Professor Sernemango de Butcher and colleagues analysed the DNA of 37 individuals buried in a cave on the Lysithi Plateau on the island's east. The majority of the burials are thought to date to the middle of the Minoan period, around 3,700 years ago. The analysis focused on the mitochondrial DNA extracted from the teeth of the skeletons, which they then compared to similar data for 130 other populations, including ancient samples from Europe and Anatolia, as well as modern peoples. The comparison seemed to completely rule out the origin of the Minoans in North Africa, a result which completely negates Evans's original theory. You see, according to the DNA samples, the ancient Cretans showed little genetic similarity to the Libyans, Egyptians or the Sudanese. They were also genetically distant from populations in the Arabian Peninsula, including the Saudis and the Yemeni. The results showed, however, that the Minoan mitochondrial DNA was most similar to populations from Western and Northern Europe. The population showed particular genetic affinities with Bronze Age populations from Sardinia and Iberia, and Neolithic samples from Scandinavia and France. The findings thus indicated that these people probably were descendants of the first humans to reach Crete around 9,000 years ago. I know, we're getting really caught up on the 9,000 years, aren't we? So Dr. George, I will call him because I cannot pronounce his name, University of Washington Professor of Medicine and Genome Sciences, is the paper's senior author. He said, about 9,000 years ago, there was an extensive migration of Neolithic humans from the regions of Anatolia that today comprise parts of Turkey and the Middle East. At the same time, the first Neolithic inhabitants reached Crete. Our mitochondrial DNA analysis shows that the Minoans' strongest genetic relationships are with these Neolithic humans, as well as with the ancient and modern Europeans. The results suggest the Minoan civilization arose 5,000 years ago in Crete from ancestral Neolithic population that had arrived from the region around 4,000 years earlier, he said. Our data suggests that the Neolithic population that gave rise to the Minoans also migrated into Europe and gave rise to the modern European peoples. Now, it's important you remember this dominant mitochondrial DNA discovery whilst we take a look at the first man who was most vocal about his beliefs about Atlantis as a real island, not a parable. This is the man we basically have to blame or to thank for most major conspiracy theories that we know today. So in 1882, American congressman Ignatius Donnelly, whose parents clearly disliked him as much as mine disliked me, published a pseudo-scientific book titled Atlantis, the Antidiluvian Well, in which he argued that the myth of Atlantis presented in Plato's dialogue Timaeus was not a fable concocted in the ancient world, but an actual place that existed until a natural disaster destroyed it. At the opening of his book, Donnelly makes the following points that there once existed in the Atlantic Ocean, opposite the mouth of the Mediterranean Sea, a large island which was the remnant of the Atlantic continent and known to the ancient world as Atlantis. That the description of the island given by Plato is not, as has been long supposed, fable, but veritable history. That Atlantis was the region where man first rose from a state of barbarism to civilization that it became, in the course of ages, a populous and mighty nation, from whose overflowing of the shores of the Gulf of Mexico, the Mississippi River, the Amazon, the Pacific coast of South America, the Mediterranean, the west coast of Europe and Africa, the Baltic, the Black Sea and the Caspians were populated by civilised nations. That it was the true antidiluvian world, the Garden of Eden that the gods and goddesses of the ancient Greeks, the Phoenicians, the Hindus and the Scandinavians were simply the kings, queens and heroes of Atlantis and the acts attributed to them in mythology, a confused recollection of real historical events, that the mythologies of Egypt and Peru represented the original religion of Atlantis, which was sun worship, that Atlantis perished in a terrible convulsion of nature in which the whole island was submerged by the ocean with nearly all its inhabitants. 
that a few persons escaped in ships and on rafts and carried to the nation's east and west tidings of the appalling catastrophe, which has survived to our own time in the flood and deluge legends of the different nations of the old and new worlds. So, as you can see from his reference to multiple religions, Donnelly's work of comparative mythology aimed to prove that Atlantis was not only the common origin of all legends and religions, but the source of all accomplishments of the ancient world, from language to agriculture. Donnelly's theory of the origin of civilization falls into a category of explanation called diffusionism by modern archaeologists. Diffusionism theorizes that geographically separated cultures sharing a common trait had actual contact with each other rather than evolving similar seeming features independently by coincidence or because of structural similarities in the human mind or in social needs. However, Donnelly took diffusionism to a whole new level, claiming all civilization came from Atlanteans. However, um, his Atlantean research methods drew from bad mathematics, misreadings of archaeological records, and mistaking ancient myths for veiled historical chronicles. So let's look at what Donnelly ascribed to Atlantis. Okay, Donnelly ascribed technology and culture to Atlantis, which was completely anachronistic. Atlantis existed 9,000 years before Socrates. However, apparently, according to him, they built temples, ships and canals and developed agriculture and trade commerce with neighbouring countries. But the oldest known canals, for example, were irrigation canals built in Mesopotamia circa 4000 BCE. But those Mesopotamian irrigation canals were built 3000 years after those which apparently existed in Atlantis, which seems like a big bloody time gap. Uh, particularly if, according to Donnelly, some of them actually escaped Atlantis and went to different areas. So there would be Atlanteans to share their knowledge. But it took 3,000 years. Additionally, according to Donnelly, the Atlanteans colonised the seacoast of Europe, the Mediterranean shores and India's lowlands. They went up to the Amazon and crossed to the Pacific coast. And they settled in Mexico, where they founded the Aztec civilization. He maintained that they even ascended the Mississippi River and its tributaries, leaving evidence of their presence in the art and customs of the mound builders. Additionally, he claimed that they were also the progenitors of the ancient civilization of Egypt. None of this relates to what Plato said about Atlantis at all. I mean, for starters, the ancient Greeks didn't know about the American continent, so they would never have recorded a civilization reaching that area. And secondly, Plato doesn't present Atlantis as a world-dominating empire. It tried to attack Asia and Europe according to the story, but it failed. Its only power extended to a few other islands and a bit of some other continent. So Donnelly really amped up how influential and powerful this Atlantis was, and he had no foundation for this. The oldest text that ever references Atlantis is Plato, but he took what Plato said and completely built on top of it an entire fictional world based on no evidence. However, it is a bit funny, because if we return to, back to our mitochondrial DNA evidence discussion, it's clear to say that Donnelly was a bit right about one aspect, that the idea that we kind of originated from what they were, the Atlanteans. Because if we were to take the argument that the Atlanteans were a metaphor for the Minoans, then the metaphoric Atlanteans were pretty damn widespread, as their mitochondrial DNA is evident in populations across the Mediterranean islands, southern Europe and mainland Europe, and is still present today in modern day residents of the Lysithi Plateau. So it weren't exactly a Garden of Eden, but the Minoans were pretty damn influential when it comes to like a genetic spread as it were. However, they never reached the Mississippi River. And what evidence did Ignatius Donnelly have about the Atlanteans crossing the Pacific coast, settling in Mexico, founding the Aztec civilization? None. His book about Atlantis was nothing more than a work of fandom, influenced by Francis Bacon's 1627 utopian novel New Atlantis and by Jules Verne's treatment of the legendary lost continent in 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. However, Donnelly was deceptive in his fan fiction as he approached it with diligent but exceptionally flawed and inaccurate scientific earnestness, discarding any evidence which contradicted his claim. However, the book was a massive bestseller that turned Donnelly into an overnight literary celebrity, and it remains the urtext for most modern stories of Atlantis and generative theories. Following its publication, mystical Atlantean cults sprung up across America, and New Orleans made the faddish continent the theme of its 1883 Mardi Gras.
You might also know Donnelly for his Shakespeare theory, the famous Shakespeare theory, in which he argued that Francis Bacon wrote all of Shakespeare's plays, claiming to have discovered a hidden cipher involved irregular pagination, hyphenation, italics and bracketing, all pointing apparently to Bacon's authorship. But that is a theory to address for another day. However, it is worth noting that Bacon actually used Atlantis in his writing, however as a philosophical commentary on society, in the same way Sir Thomas More did in Utopia. Donnelly has been credited for helping create and popularise the modern counter-history narratives that dominate American culture today. As Charles Pierre wrote, what Donnelly did was keep this counter-history in its proper place as a subtext, a grace notes, as a niggling little doubts that are firmly in the democratic tradition as any campaign speeches. To round off this video, Atlantis was a symbol. It represented every society that destroyed itself through hubris or succumbed to natural disasters. It was a haunting myth of how societies would fall and become obliterated from existence, a harrowing warning to the Athenians and a reminder of their culture and society's mortality. But the contemporary myth and belief in Atlantis aren't as harmless as people think, as it has ties to eugenics and Nazism. And if you're curious and would like to know more about how that links into everything, then you should make sure that you like this video so you can tell me that you'd like the rest of this series and subscribe to my channels so you don't miss out on when those videos are released. Thank you so much for watching today's video. It was a long one. It was a hot and sweaty one. And thank you so much to my Patreons for making this video possible. This was extensive. It kept going on and I had to try and cut it short as much as possible. Forgive my mispronunciations. Forgive any errors. Please let me know down below. And I will carry on with this discussion in another episode of the Atlantis series. But until next time, thank you so much for watching. I hope you are happy and healthy. And remember, books save lives. So keep reading.